Welcome to another short video um, from the University of Liverpool. This time we're going to provide an update on the state of talks about the future relationship between the EU and the UK, especially after the informal summit that took place in Salzburg last week. Now at the outset, it is important to remember that these talks aren't yet uh, at the stage of formal negotiations. The two sides are currently engaged in preliminary discussions with a view to agreeing a political declaration that will outline what the future relationship should look like and thus provide an overall agenda for its negotiation. Now that political declaration is meant to be agreed by October or at the very latest November this year as part of the overall withdrawal package alongside the legally binding treaty that will cover the more immediate issues of a transitional period and an orderly separation. But formal negotiations about the future will only commence after the UK has left and become a third country. And the two sides hope that the agreement on the future relationship can be completed by the end of the transitional period, though of course that's not guaranteed and, and many commentators believe that it's a rather over-optimistic timescale. So for now, the two parties are trying to sketch out a vision of what the future might look like. And that vision has to cover a very large number of fields and issues, from trade to security, state aid to data protection, the environment through to scientific cooperation and so on. Now today I'm going to concentrate on the question of trade, because it's the big question that tends to dominate our public discussion here in the UK. Now in principle, the UK's choices for the future are pretty clear. Um, either there's no special agreement between the UK and the EU and we end up trading on WTO terms. Now every rational actor agrees that that would be deeply damaging. Um, or there's a free trade agreement akin to that between the EU and Canada um, and here the, the clear weight of analysis says that that wouldn't be quite as bad but it would still have significant negative repercussions. Or there's a close cooperation agreement which would entail continued UK participation in the single market, perhaps also the customs union, and that outcome would, would effectively preserve, as far as possible, the existing terms of trade and economic development. So continued single market and customs union membership makes the best economic sense. But that brings us on to an equally important political choice. Do you want to be a leading member of the club that makes the rules, with a full voice at the table and a vote on the legislation? Or do you want to be an outsider who follows the rules that are made by other countries with little or uh, influence or say of your own? Now, of course, that isn't a real choice. Um, you want to be a rule taker. You don't want to be a rule, uh, a rule maker, sorry, not a rule taker. Um, but that sums up, I think, the problem not only with advocates of a hard Brexit, but also with advocates of a soft Brexit. Because a hard Brexit risks inflicting serious economic damage upon the UK on top of radically diminishing our influence in the operation and development of the global economy. Whereas soft Brexit advocates are at least trying to minimise the economic damage that Brexit will bring upon the UK, but they can't really provide an effective answer to the political dilemma, isn't it better to be a rule maker rather than a rule taker? Now responsible members of the government also of course, no one understands this dilemma. But for most of the past two years, they've tried to square the circle by rejecting the very idea that the UK should be limited to the basic range of choices that we've just described, and instead insisting that the UK should enjoy a deep and special partnership with the EU, which simply defies existing precedent. Now, of course, that's a nice sounding aspiration, but in practice, it has tended to boil down to the idea that the UK can simply keep many of the existing benefits of EU membership without having to play by the same rules and obligations as the member states have to. And unsurprisingly, of course, the EU has made it clear right from the very outset of this whole process that that isn't uh, a, credible, um, a credible option. No partnership with a third country can offer the same benefits as EU membership, and anyhow, the UK's own red lines rule out even the sort of close cooperation model that we see with countries like Norway. And so at least when it comes to trade, that means that the UK should have to make do with an ordinary trade agreement of the sort that the EU negotiates with countries such as Canada or Japan. And while such a trade agreement can be ambitious, it can be wide-ranging, um, it can't amount to participation in or cherry-picking from the single market. In, a way, in effect, the, the Union's overriding priority in this process is to preserve the integrity and the smooth functioning of its single greatest achievement and its single greatest asset, and that is the single market itself. Now, all of that brings us to the Chequers Plan, 
which was finally proposed by the UK government earlier this summer. And many viewers will, will already be aware that the centrepiece of the Chequers proposals on economic cooperation consists of two limbs. First of all, a free trade area for goods that would be based on a common rulebook, um, which would see the UK continue to apply certain EU rules governing trade in goods. Not all such rules, um, only those necessary to avoid literal border checks between the EU and the UK. And secondly, a so-called facilitated customs arrangement, whereby the UK would adopt its own regimes uh, for tariffs on other third country goods, its own regulatory standards for matters that fall outside the common rulebook, but simultaneously would continue to apply and enforce the EU's separate tariffs and potentially divergent regulations at the UK's own borders. Now beyond this proposal, it's fair to say that under the Chequers plan, the government has at least dropped some of its more unrealistic demands for special treatment. For example, in the field of financial services, where the UK does not accept that if it refuses to play by the EU's rules, then the prospect of privileged single market access, which UK businesses have hitherto enjoyed, will most certainly come to an end. But it's the Chequers proposals on trade and goods that have attracted the most attention and criticism. And those proposals on goods are particularly important because they're not just about finding a model for the future of EU-UK trade so as to minimise the negative impacts upon our own manufacturing and agriculture and consumers. They're also part of the government's attempt to propose a workable solution that would avoid the reintroduction of customs and regulatory checks at the Northern Irish border, without having to fall back on any default or insurance provisions that will be contained in any Article 50 treaty. So what should we make of the Chequers proposals? Now here it's obvious that there are actually two main audience for the Chequers plan, and each of the reactions is crucially important, but each of those reactions is shaped and determined by very different and not necessarily compatible perspectives and factors. We have the domestic audience and the European audience. Now thinking first about the domestic reaction, what strikes me is how so much of the UK political reaction and a lot of the media coverage feels really quite out of kilter with the actual content of the government's proposals. After all, at least when they're framed within the admittedly rather peculiar domestic UK debate about our future relations with the EU, the Chequers plan is actually a fairly modest proposal. It's about partially aligning UK law with EU rules as regards a limited part of the economy in order to attain a degree of privileged market access. This isn't a soft Brexit, as some government supporters have claimed in an attempt to win over wavering Remain voters. It's certainly not the national betrayal which has been claimed by some of the more hysterical Leave campaigners using the sort of stab in the back narrative which is familiar um, to charlatans and demagogues throughout the ages. But by and large, and again I stress, at least when viewed through the lens of our own domestic political debate, the UK is arguing for a fairly ordinary free trade agreement with a limited degree of closer cooperation in selected fields. Yet if even those fairly modest proposals appear to be absolutely and utterly unacceptable to Brexit uh, enthusiasts, it does usefully remind us of just how uncompromising their views really are. Now that's, that's not to say that even from a domestic perspective, the Chequers plan doesn't deserve critical scrutiny. Of course it does. For example, the, the Chequers proposals on a facilitated customs arrangement don't really differ in any significant respect from the customs proposals which the government published in the summer of 2017. And those proposals were already severely criticised at the time, not least by business because they regarded them as the prelude to a massive increase in bureaucracy as vast quantities of goods would have to be categorised and tracked and verified throughout processes of manufacture, import and export. And needless to say, of course, for all of those sectors where the government isn't seeking any form of close cooperation with the EU, such as financial services, there are grave concerns that the Chequers plan will lead to a marked deterioration in the existing conditions for trade and economic development. A deterioration that no amount of rhetoric about global Britain um, can possibly compensate for. But just as important as the domestic reaction to Chequers is the other made audience. Um, how far would the government's plans prove acceptable to the EU? Well, the Salzburg summit has provided us with an answer, at least on trade, checkers won't work, certainly not as it stands.
Now, it's almost surreal, I think, to, to, to watch the reaction of the UK government, again, and a lot of the media, to the outcome of the Salzburg summit. Um, the reaction has been, frankly, disingenuous in, in two main ways. First of all, we're told that this somehow came as a surprise, as if no one had or could have uh, seen it coming. And secondly, we're told that the UK was somehow treated with disrespect by the EU, that, that the EU had dismissed the government's plans out of hand, that it had failed to explain what was wrong with checkers, that the UK's proposals had been rejected without any detailed rationale. Now, the truth is that the EU's reaction was entirely obvious and predictable right from the moment that the checkers plan was published, if not before. No one who's followed the Article 50 process with anything approaching an objective eye could possibly have been surprised at the outcome of the Salzburg summit. And given that the UK and the EU have been talking in detail about the Chequers plan and its problems for many weeks in the run-up to Salzburg, it is really quite surprising to find that the government was in fact wallowing in a state of almost complete ignorance about the outcome. Now, a more cynical observer might suspect that the government's reaction is designed prim primarily to whip up a little, a little bit of nationalistic fervour um, at the idea of poor Britain having been ambushed and insulted by the nasty foreigners as part of a broader strategy, of course, which is very familiar um, in the Leave movement of finding scapegoats um, to blame for the fact that Brexit isn't working out quite as well as they had claimed that it would. But anyhow, let's explore in more detail why the EU regards the Chequers trade plan as unacceptable. Now there are certainly interesting questions about the, the credibility and workability of Chequers from a technical or logistical or, or regulatory point of view, but in reality those are of secondary importance to the more fundamental political problems posed by the Chequers plan. Now let's start by recalling that the customs model which has been re-proposed by the UK again was already subject to extensive critical reaction by the EU when it was first unveiled over a year ago. Um, the UK says it wants to take back control of its borders and its money by expecting the EU to surrender its control over its borders and its money. In effect, the EU is being asked to allow the UK to collect the EU's own income and to enforce the EU's own public interest, public safety and public policy regulations. But of course, taking back control cuts both ways. Beyond customs, the UK proposals, of course, raise immediate accusations of cherry picking. For example, why should the UK have special treatment when it comes to goods when it wants to reject the parallel systems which govern persons or companies or services or capital, to say nothing of the common commercial policy which seeks to establish uniform trade conditions with the rest of the world. Even within the field of goods itself, for example, why should the EU27 have to submit their state aid plans to independent external scrutiny by the Commission when the UK proposes that it will simply scrutinise and approve its own state aid plans? Or, for example, why should the EU27 have to submit to binding dispute settlement by the European Court of Justice? They have to guarantee that they'll give priority to their single market obligations within their own national legal systems when the UK says that it'll simply have some form of international arbitration and it insists that it should remain free to break the rules at its own leisure and pleasure. Now, at the very least, th these raise a very obvious question. Um, why should the EU offer special privileges of market access to the UK when the UK is openly threatening to use its newfound third country status to create competitive advantages for its own industry, advantages which then can then be immediately and unfairly directed back against the EU economy. But more fundamentally, the EU here has, has a strong and, and entirely legitimate political imperative to ensure that any agreement it reaches with a third country doesn't pose an external threat to the smooth functioning of the EU's internal trade system. Remember that the single market is a complex, a multifaceted and an interdependent trade bargain. It gives extensive rights and opportunities, but it also comes with corresponding obligations. Now, every member state knows that that comes as a bargain, as a whole. You don't have to like all of it, but every country knows that the overall bargain is worth it, and they also know that everybody has to play by the same rules. If a third country is allowed to disaggregate or unravel or pick and choose between the elements of the single market, it risks not only undermining its internal cohesion, but also its very legitimacy. And perhaps our domestic debate here has become so insular and so self-referential that we simply overlook a, a, very, a very obvious fact. 
Because ultimately what makes the government's plan so unrealistic is that the UK wants to be treated as special. But not just compared to other third countries, the EU wants to be treated as special even when compared to how the member states treat themselves within the context of the EU. And that is simply not a credible proposition. So over the next few days and weeks, um, both the UK and the EU27 are going to have to make some pretty hard-headed judgments which are fraught with some quite serious political risks. How far can the UK government go in modifying its own checkers proposals, whether towards closer cooperation with the EU or for a more distant economic relationship, without triggering either outright mutiny back home or throwing away its parliamentary majority? Conversely, how far are the EU27 willing to sacrifice some of their own values, some of their own principles, is the price for securing a workable template for future negotiations with the UK, bearing in mind, of course, that this whole mess has been entirely of the UK's own making. But we shouldn't lose sight of another crucially important decision that might also soon need to be made. Because what happens if we reach October or November and the two sides have finalised a legally binding treaty on separation and transition, but they haven't managed to secure agreement on a credible political declaration about the future? Now, the UK government remains adamant that this must be a complete package. If any one element of the deal is missing, there will be no deal at all. Is that a sensible position to maintain? Arguably not. If the government sacrifices a workable treaty on separation and transition just because it can't admit to the public that its plans for the future were and, and remain undeliverable, then we'll all end up paying a very heavy price indeed for a new deal outcome that could have been avoided. Yet that already difficult political dilemma has been made legally more complicated by the European Union Withdrawal Act that was finally adopted over the summer. Because after all, the new legislation provides that the final EU-UK deal can only be ratified by the government if the House of Commons gives its prior approval to the withdrawal package, both the separation and transition treaty, but also the political declaration on the future. So effectively, we've enshrined into law the government's all-or-nothing approach to these negotiations. All of which means that the government's insistence that, that, that the unworkable Chequers plan is the only plan on the table does feel really quite reckless, to say the least. We'll be back soon from Liverpool um, with more updates as events continue to unfold. In the meantime, remember that you can always catch up on our other videos on our uh, EU Law uh, uh, at Liverpool YouTube channel. Um, you can read in more detail some of our publications and reports. And of course, we might see you at one of our regular talks up and down the UK.